where we're going to try to explore this section is the idea about inverse and inverse functions. And so I hope you remember a little bit from our previous course uh, what inverse functions were uh, and what they weren't. And so I'll just, I'll just lightly touch on them here. But if you need to explore a little bit more and refresh your memory greater, please go back a couple of chapters and you kind of explore how we dealt with inverse functions back in our algebra sequence. So one of the things that we needed to have in an inverse function was this idea uh, where the function, if it has an inverse, there's a horizontal line test. Uh, and what we're going to look at is our sinusoidal functions to begin with, for example, sine. So on my red, on red here, I have a sine function. And you can see that this function, we remember, continues infinitely to the left, to negative infinity, and goes on to positive infinity to the right. And that if I took any one spot uh, that crosses this line, like a horizontal line test, I can see that it only crosses once right there. But if I extended it all the way out to the left or to the right, I will see that it will cross the function in multiple places. Therefore, it won't have a true um, inverse. So what we do in this case is we have to learn to restrict because there's lots of, lots of cool information we discover uh, within sines and cosines. But to find its inverse, we have to begin with the restricted domain. So when we talk about inverse functions for sines and cosines, we're going to be talking about a restricted domain. For a sine, we typically look at from the point um, minus pi halves to positive pi halves. So we have a restricted domain. No, there's red. Um, where x is greater than We have a restricted domain and they're equal to. So given those initial conditions, we can now talk about its inverse. So what's its inverse? Well, there's a couple ways to think about it. One way to think about it, its inverse are its coordinates just switched around. Where we have our x and y coordinates, its inverse are those same values, but it's the y becomes the x, the x becomes the y. Um, and how, we designate, and how we designate that, we use this term, well, I'll show you here in a second. Another way, rather than thinking about the, uh, the coordinates switched, we can also go ahead and kind of graph that out with that type of an idea. So where we traditionally have our y equals sine x, an inverse, and we designate it as such, the inverse of x, uh, and I have y over here, y equals the inverse of x in that particular fashion. Uh, some people also still use uh, y equals the arc sine. Arc sine of x. And for our purposes, if we look at this, what that's really saying is, is that x equals the sine of y. And, and that's where we see the two coordinates reversed. So let's go ahead and graph this out and overlay its inverse on top of this existing function. So if that's the case where I know that this point is at the point negative pi halves uh, and negative one, its inverse point is over negative one and down negative pi halves. Uh, I know it still goes to zero, zero. This point right here is at the point pi halves and up one. So its inverse would be over one and up pi halves. And then that's enough points to kind of get a general sense of what's happening here. All right, I try to draw it. And so there's a reflection there. And all inverses have a reflection about this y equals x axis. Sorry, I tried to draw as straight as I could uh, to give you a sense. So that's what an inverse is. It's a reflection of the original graph reflected about the x, uh, the y equals x axis. And our terminology that we'll use is that we'll say that y is the inverse of x, or, or the, yeah, the, sign, uh, the inverse sine of x. Some people still might use the word arc sine, uh, of so forth. And it reflects where now we have x equals the sine of y. And what we're looking for is basically is, is what's the angle of a certain particular y value that we have. So let's do an example that we have um, right here. I want to know the inverse sine of root 2 over 2. 
How would I deal with that? How would I kind of think about that? So what we're looking for is, is what's the angle now that produces the result of, of root two over two, or whose angle becomes sine root two over two. And this is where we have to go back and kind of remember some of those key, um, those key points, uh, those key angles, those key values that we had for sine functions. So we remember whose angle makes a root two over two, and that was uh, four. So the angle pi over four, the sine of pi over four is root two over two. And how this says again is whose angle produces a root two over two. So we're kind of thinking about signs just from the other direction. Before we found we had the angle and we wanted to find its sign. Now we have its sign, but we want to go backwards and find out whose its angle is. And that's what an inverse function does in this particular case. The other thing I have to keep in mind is that we have to look at these within its restricted domain. Uh, remember, the inverse's, inverse's domain was restricted from negative pi halves to positive pi halves. So when I think about particular angles or the inverses, I have to make sure that my result is also within that restricted domain. Let's look at another example. Um, the inverse sine of minus one over two. So again, what we're looking at is, is what's the angle that produces a sine of negative one half? That's what the inverse is asking. So which angle produced a sine of negative one half? And if we remember those key values again, the ones I've asked you to kind of memorize, be aware of, uh, maybe to have them written down on a table that you refer to all the time, we remember that the sine of negative one half was a minus pi six. So the angle who produces, the angle, uh, minus pi six produces a sine of negative one half. So there's a couple of examples of how to kind of think about inverse signs.